Our topic today is parental alienation. Our guest is Ron Burgless. Ron is the chair of the Parental Alienation Legislative Group with his colleague, Dr. Lynn Steinberg, and a group of like-minded alienated parents to uh, force and enact le legislation that would require all mental health professionals, and this was really interesting to me, Ron, to require all mental health practitioners who work with children to be educated in parental alienation. And of course, I thought everybody would be if they worked with children. They also continue, Ron and uh, Dr. Steinberg, they also continue to combat through legislative action, the plethora of misinformation campaigns that have appeared recently that deny the existence of parental alienation. Give a quick definition of parental alienation and then why is anybody denying it? I'm sorry, Judith, you froze on that question. Did I really? I never froze before. Okay, oh. so that's a new a new one. So I said, would you please define parental alienation, do a quick definition, and then why are is it being denied? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, but the, the definition is usually occurs in a high conflict divorce or separation where one parent out of revenge or jealousy or just malign intent uh, due to personality dysfunction, like borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, uh, uses the children as revenge against the other parent by weaponizing them to reject their other parent for no no justifiable reason. And they, uh, the children who all the time still love that parent are coerced into rejecting that parent, causing long-term trauma and damage to the children. Just a little aside on that. Mm -hmm. In when you told me when I initially talked to you that it can happen outside of divorce, it can happen in the normal course of the marriage if you, I guess, are married to somebody who has a, a high conflict personality. Correct. So, it, so too, it, it, then it becomes awful. Did it? It happened during your marriage, didn't it? Preceding the divorce. Yes, it did. Um, I should bring up the elephant in the room here that it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been codependent. You know, it happens frequently um, when you marry somebody who fills a need in you, and you don't really see the person for who they are, but rather for what they can do for you. You wind up making huge mistakes, um, and your marriage is terminally damaged because of that. In my case. Um, she said all kinds of rules that I didn't understand and couldn't, didn't agree with, but I, I lived with it for the sake of the marriage. Um, so it got so bad. I couldn't go out with my, she wouldn't let me go out for a walk with my children. She never accused me of doing anything to them ever. Um, but she just didn't want me to be alone with them. I played with them in the house. We played all kinds of imaginary games. Um, we did all kinds of things together, but when I came to leaving the house or going to the supermarket, uh, she wouldn't let me. She would literally bar the door, stand in front of the door like this and not let me leave the house. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was, um, I called the police close on 20 times just on just to get out of the house with my children. Um, in the end, my son and I were reduced to sitting in the garage building toys together. You know, we built a toy car, which I've still got, by the way, um, some 20 years later. Um, but yeah, that's where it started and it got worse. It got to the point where she was reading all the bedtime stories to them. I wasn't allowed to read bedtime stories to them. I was kind of sandwiched between my son and the wall in a hundred degree heat in our house um, in Highland, California, near Redlands. Um, she wouldn't let me turn on the ceiling fan because she said it was too destructive. Um, and it just got worse from there. It got to the point where she was cooking them dinner and making me wait outside the kitchen till they were done eating before I could come in and cook my food. And so I was effectively uh, sidelined for my children's lives long before we ever got divorced. In the end, I thought the only way to have a relationship with my children was to get divorced in order to have some time with them, custodial time with them. How long were you married, Ron? Four and a half years. How long did you date? Oh, um, probably less than a year. Less we than met, a year. I was living in London at the time and we met taking walks on Hampstead Heath in North London. We got together then. 
so that what I find interesting in marriages that have at least one high conflict personality, and that's the way I've come to talk with people who are either narcissists, sociopaths, borderline, it, and it comes from a gentleman who's written a lot of books on communication with high conflict personalities. His name is Bill Eddy and very well respected year round. Does that name ring a bell to you? I know him. I've worked with him. Okay. He's amazing, isn't he? Yes, he is. And these books that he writes, everybody listening, I talk about them all the time. I've read them. I use them even mm -hmm. when I'm talking to my own clients. If sure. I haven't determined that I have a high conflict personality client. Um, yeah. So, so they're wonderful. And it's interesting. We talk about not recognizing the high conflict personality prior to marriage because there's either love bombing, they're on their best behavior, they can hold it together for a little while, mm -hmm. and then the the wall goes down, so to speak, once the marriage takes place because you don't need to impress, so to speak, right? Yeah. In and my case, she, she presented herself as the super mother, uh, super wife. You know, when we got together, she did everything and it was like treating me like a king. Um, and it was difficult to turn it down. You know, she did everything. And then when we had our first child, our son, she did everything. She changed his diapers. She breastfed him until I think he was four or five. Um, she comforted him all the time to the extent that when he fell down and I picked him up, she would take him out of my hands and put him to her breast. Um, that happened constantly. So all these little things were happening throughout the marriage that would slowly push me out of the way, sometimes at my own, with my own agreement, you know, because I was, wasn't used to be treated like that. And I bet it took a while with the exceptional treatment that you received mm -hmm. prior to marriage to understand, wait a minute, this is part of her personality. This isn't just an off day. Was mm -hmm. it kind of like that at the beginning? Well, I didn't understand what was going on. I was I was left feeling constantly like I was doing something wrong. And in the end, I, out of my own protection, self-care, I went to see a therapist. And the therapist was the first person that ever mentioned to me the book Stop Walking on Eggshells, which was like became my Bible. Um, and after that, um, I started um, inhabiting chat rooms for people uh, dealing with people with borderline personality disorder, BPD chat rooms, they're called. And I educated myself in the phenomenon um, but it wasn't until my, um, after we divorced and things got really rough that somebody recommended that I see, um, Jane Schaefer, she's uh, the late Jane Schaefer. And I went to see her and she's the first person that ever mentioned the words parental alienation to me. And we walked out of that room. Like we had just, um, had this enormous revelation. It all made all the pieces come together. And it was that moment that I realized that this wasn't just happening to my kids, but it's happening to lots of kids. You know, yes, and you know, I just looked up a few statistics uh, before this interview. I wanted to know what percentage of parents uh, engaged in parental alienation, but what I saw was interesting that almost two to one, it's women who orchestrate parental alienation. You know, that may be true, but I think um, with the amount of misinformation going on right now, it's important to point out that it's not gender specific. Men as well as women engage in parental alienation. Uh, it's a horrible phenomenon when it's happening and it doesn't make one side better or worse. Both sexes indulge in it and it's to the detriment of their own children. There seems to be no rhyme or reason for it. It's very obviously destructive for the children, yet parents indulge in destroying their children's calm and the love for the other parent, which is, in my my mind, a sin against humanity, a sin against God, if you like, um, because they're destroying the hopes and dreams of their own children. Right. And I don't think they realize that a lot of children, once they become adults at a certain age, actually and, figure out what's going on and could possibly sorry, you, turn you, you, about... You, turn against the parent who is the offender, so to speak? I, I got uh, the last part of that possibly turn against the other. Um, when they become adults, if the damage is long lasting, which it usually is, like in my case, I've had no contact with my son in over five years. And he believes thoroughly that he has made that decision for himself to mm. reject me. Um, and it's, you know, it's the term is splitting. 
where a child will get to the point where they see one parent is all good and one parent is all bad. And oddly enough, a, a term has come up recently in all the misinformation as if it's common knowledge that there is a preferred parent. The preferred parent is um, forced to stop having contact with their child. But who ever heard of the term preferred parent before? Sometimes when a child is um, chastised by one parent, the other parent says, go ahead. That's the preferred parent at that moment. But there's no such thing as a preferred parent for a child. You know, yeah. it's just garbage. Um, you brought something up again, and I meant to do, I meant to uh, explore the second half of the first question I asked you. Why is there misinformation? What's going on? Well, there's a mountain of it out there right now. Um, there's a group of people, including a, a professor at Georgetown University, who've written papers, supposedly scholarly papers, um, disavowing the existence of parental alienation, saying it's used by men as a uh, who sexual abusers to regain control of their children and continue uh, uh, abusing them. However, these the people that are doing this are mostly women. Um, are saying that they are not listened to in court. They've created this whole movement uh, around the idea that women are who are, are complaining about sexual abuse in their marriages are being ignored. And uh, the courts are listening to the fathers who are sexual abusers and favoring the fathers, therefore leaving the children in the hands of their uh, so-called abuser. Usually these, these accusations come up um, during the divorce. They haven't come up before the divorce. But nevertheless, courts pay special attention to this, and the whole tenor of the divorce changes to the accusation against the father. And the father is left having to defend themselves. I'm not saying this doesn't happen. I'm sure there are fathers uh, who, who use parental alienation as a tactic, especially if they read about other people doing it. They think, I can do it too. But that doesn't negate the existence of parental alienation. And by and large, the women who are accusing men of these things are themselves alienators. And what's happening is they are con con conditioning their children to speak out on their behalf, saying they're being torn apart from their preferred parent. And this has reached a crescendo right now in Sacramento with uh, Rubio SB331, um, Peaky's Law, it's called, where they're trying to ban reunification therapy. Usually, um, if parental alienation is found to have occurred in a marriage and an enlightened court, the judge, with, an help, with the help of an expert witness, will uh, order a transfer of custody to the alienated parent because there's never been a study where it's proved that a child is damaged by that change of custody. They will be transferred to the rejected parent for 90 days with no contact with the alienating parent. And then that child and that targeted parent will go through reunification therapy. Now, these people are saying it should be banned. They're saying that this, this law would prevent judges from ordering reunification therapy, thereby removing judicial discretion. This is anathema to most legislators in Sacramento. It should be. I've spoken to several Superior Court judges um, who all think it's all think it's awful. I've spoken to professors in uh, University of California who are experts in child abuse, who think people are fools if they disavow the existence of parental alienation. Nevertheless, this law is about to get its second reading in Sacramento, and we are opposing it for obvious reasons. One, because even the FBI use, uses reunification therapy. Uh, Canada, it's accepted across the country. Uh, reunification therapy is common practice there. And this right here, it's just been banned in Colorado, reunification therapy, by the way, the legislature banned it. Um, but here we have a chance to oppose it. It's The bill's gonna be read again, end of June, beginning of July. And any right-minded people should write to the Judiciary Committee and oppose this legislation because one, it has nothing to do with the crime on which it's based. And two, it would, dis it would destroy the chances for children to be reunified with their same parent for a long time. So question, in the reunification of parent and child, mm -hmm. is it 90 days with no contact with the alienating parent because you need at least that much time uninterrupted to build a rapport again? You have to understand that these children ordered into 90-day um, uh, reversal of custody have been thoroughly brainwashed against the other parent. So um, the alienating parents are busy suing the expert witnesses, suing the therapists involved in reunification therapy, saying that, look what the children say, listen to what the children say. 
Well, of course, they're going to support their alienating parent because they've been doing this for years. These children don't even know that they're repeating the wishes of the alienating parent and they're rejecting their other parent. And this is going on and it's destroying the career of expert witnesses and reunification therapists who have been doing great jobs for alienating parents and their children. Our focus is on the children. You know, it's not on what happened to me or any other alienated parent. It's trying to protect the children from the abuser who was not always what they seem to be. So I know from being a divorce mediator myself, and I should pause for a second and say that Ron is also a mediator in several courts in family law. So not only is he working uh, legislatively, but he's also working in the trenches, so to speak, um, in mediation. And, and so that's great, Ron, that you have your, your 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 foot in all of this, your fingers in all of this. I don't understand how anybody can say parental alienation doesn't take place. I've interviewed children who were victims of parental alienation on this podcast, and they explain how horrible it is. Uh, one lady, she's from Greece, and uh, she's now married with her own daughter, but her book is about what it was like for her going through her parents' divorce and how her father was so uh, brutalized, emotionally abused by mom who could never get over the fact that there was a divorce and there was another woman and it, it just marred her for life. She couldn't move past that, therefore held her child hostage, but not really intentionally. She would do things like cry constantly. And so the daughter thought, well, I better take care of my mom. My dad's not crying, so he's probably okay. I'll get to dad years later after I'm an adult. Mom me needs my help. Now, for a child to have to do that and choose a parent because that parent seems to be crumbling emotionally and not getting help and not moving on, that's a <laughs> I think that's more common than people think. It is. It's, you know, as a matter of fact, when we were tr trying to oppose this, to enact our own legislation in Sacramento and trying to hire our lobbyists uh, to represent us to the legislature, we interviewed several lobbyists up there, some from quite powerful firms. And the two men from two different companies that we talked to both had had parental alienation in their family and just didn't know what it was called. You know, and then when we went up to Sacramento recently, Dr. Steinberg and I, and were lo lobbying against this SB331, um, several of the aides that we spoke to had had it in their family as well. And they were just aghast when they found out what the bill was really about. You know, look, Judith, this bill revolves around Peaky, who was a little boy who went on a custod custodial visit with his father, and the father killed him. And that's, you know, this stuff happens. Um, it's, it was a terrible thing. Nobody's denying that it happened. And we watched the mother, who was a good friend of Senator Rubio's, get up at the first reading of the bill and present uh, reasons why this bill should pass. And she was very emotional, as one would understand. She cried. Um, and it really moved the committee. It moved a lot of people, you know. But I, I don't sympath I don't uh, lack sympathy for, for this mother, this poor mother. However... My reaction also was that tears don't only blind those who cry. The legislature watched, the legislative committee watched this presentation and made the decision based on the emotion of the moment rather than the science behind it. They would have found out that Peaky's death had nothing to do with reunification therapy, had nothing to do with anything. The, the therapist should have done research into the father risk assessment of the father before they let him ever have custody of the child. But banning reunification therapy has nothing to do with it. It's just the actions of a malevolent group of people, mostly women. I, I assume there's some men in there, but I haven't seen any, who are bent on destroying the idea of parental alienation and remaining in control of the children. Parental alienation at its heart, Judith, is about control. Right. All about control. Very, very rarely has to do with love. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, anything that has to do with love is a positive thing, mm -hmm. generally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And just because parents aren't getting along doesn't mean that the children shouldn't have full access to both parents. And that's one of the hardest things, I think, in divorce is to separate, okay, this is about our relationship parents this is not about anything about the children and so the task forward will be let's take care of ourselves in the best way possible and let's be available to our children the question i've asked a lot of people when we're talking about anything that has to do with children is and i don't have children so this is why i keep focusing on this i was a child i know what i felt like as a child i may still be a child god only knows but um, wait a minute, I lost, oh, best interest of the child. I almost lost my train of thought. Best interest of the child. It must be enormously difficult though, Ron, going through a divorce, healing yourself. I talk about you have to heal yourself before you file for the divorce. If you try filing for a divorce while you're angry, it's going to be horrifying. How do you heal yourself how do you deal with the decisions of uh, separating assets and debts, uh, creating a co-parenting plan, living in two homes, moving the children back and forth, and still think of best interest of the child, focus on your children, not make ne negative statements about the other parent. I think this is probably one of the hardest things in the world people have to do when they're getting divorced. What do you think? I think you're absolutely right. It's really difficult. I, I know for me, I'd never heard of parental alienation when I was getting divorced. And so I made all kinds of mistakes. I made I tried to not badmouth my ex to my children. I didn't always succeed. Sometimes she did terrible things, cut into custody time, and I didn't have time with my children, even though they were living around the corner from me. It was like they were living on Mars. And so I would get very frustrated because all my life, Judith, I wanted to be a parent. All my life, I wanted to have a family. That was my dream, you know. And so when that was ripped away from me, I, 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 I raged, you know. And when it became a done deal and I hardly saw my children, I, I did have suicidal ideations. I, I got terribly depressed. In fact, the stress of, of that um, not seeing my children, coupled with my job, which was working in a high-conflict school, um, and I had a stroke um, oh, about five years ago. I had a stroke. Um, it left my left side paralyzed. It was, in fact, one of the last times I saw my son who came to visit me at home. Um, after that, I don't think I saw him again. Um, but yeah, I worked hard and I happened in November 2017. And I went back to work in August 2018. I really worked hard. And now I'm completely I, I've been completely functional for a long time. Oh my. I cry a lot. It's one of the things that um, it left me with emotional lability. Um, I, I promise I'm not to do it on this show, but it happens, you know. But as far as how you can heal yourself, arm yourself with information, see a therapist, hopefully a therapist that knows about parental alienation. There are some that say they do, but they don't. So do your research and find a good therapist who knows what's going on. I didn't have that experience. My experience of therapists was miserable. None of them knew it or understood it, or they said they did, but they didn't. Okay, so this is part of this wonderful outline that you sent me, that if you don't already have this on your website, and we're gonna go through this now, I'm gonna put it in my blog. Uh, I always do a blog two days after this uh, uploads uh, on Wednesday, so I do a blog on Fridays. But I love this. Can we quickly go through this? What you did was wonderful. So here's what he did. He Ron gave me an outline. I'm going to let him go through it in three sections. What you can do if you are being alienated, what you can do prior to filing for divorce, during the divorce, and after the divorce, you know, once you are in two residences. So Ron, can we go through those? What, what are the most important things to do preparing for the divorce? Well, like I said, find a good attorney that knows about parental alienation. That's number one, they're rare, you know. Um, and you remember that you're always on court time. Constantly you're on court time. So you have to behave yourself also in order to prove you deserve custody time with your children, get evidence because your ex will inevitably interfere 
with the custody time and, and, and program the children to reject you and, not, and say they don't want to see you. So get airtight custody time. And when that comes up to, for question because of your ex, have video evidence ready um, to present to the court about your children having a good time with you in your home and out of your home. So if, on, if, 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 you're, if, if your ex continues to interfere with custody time, try and get a temporary restraining order. Well, well wait a minute. We haven't hit that yet. We're preparing okay. right now. Let's okay. not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> um, okay. So we're preparing for the divorce. Mm -hmm. As you, you know, it's coming up, either you've already talked about it together or in your own mind, you're going to talk about it. And you know that custody might be a giant issue because you're not on the same page as parents. We'll just leave it like that, right? Mm -hmm. So photographs of you having fun with the kids, going out with them, playing in the house, things like that, video. Yeah, photographs can be you, you can be you can be accused of photoshopping them or doctoring them, you know. But video is works well. I I was I've just finished being a mediator for the last year in the Sacramento Superior Court doing restraining orders of civil harassment, and the number of times the the court did not award a restraining order because there was no evidence. The court looks for evidence. That's paramount importance. If you have video evidence, a of your children having a great time with you, and b. If you're showing your ex interfering with that custody time, um, your chances are significantly better. Uh, letters that your children may write you, pictures they may do in school. Sorry, you, you froze know. just now, Judith, on letters. So, uh, you know what, you're freezing too, by the way. Oh, I guess sorry. this is just a tough day in internet yeah. land. But I was saying, so little things additionally, like kids do things in school, they have to draw pictures of their family mm -hmm. so if there's really positive things like that maybe mm -hmm. um save all of those that they give you yeah okay. show that there was a formerly great relationship um with your children but you know when it happened to me judith everything was fine until i got permission to pick them up from school on the days that i had them she was ab absolutely adamant that i could not pick them up from school i had to pick them up from her home she got to pick them up from school and the, I went to court, represented myself, and I got permission to pick them up in school. On that day, everything turned. I was waiting in the schoolyard for them to come out of their room and as all the other children were running and laughing and joining their parents. And my two kids came out of their room, looked like hell frozen over. They didn't want to talk to me. They were angry, sullen. They refused to get in the car. Um, I finally got them in the car with the help of my a guardian ad litem who spoke to them on the phone. Um, I got them to the house. They started trying to run away. It was hell. Um, and they were they were behaving really badly in a shocking way. I, I, I had no warning that that would happen. And I couldn't understand why they were doing it. At one point, one of them was running into me. The other one was kicking me in the ankles, um, saying horrendous things. They were little kids. How you know, old were I, they? I, Ron, how old were they? They were five or six, you know, just okay. terrible. And um, I just... I thought of standing there in between them, I thought, wonder if anybody would believe what's going on inside my house right now. You know, and that's that's part of the problem is people don't believe you when you say that children are treating you that miserably because you're their sounds, parent. You well, it be sounds to... like it just changed on a dime. Yeah. How can children be influenced to that degree from last week we had a wonderful time going to the zoo, whatever, to kicking you? Let me tell you, um, when my daughter eventually asked by text if she could come and live with me when she was 12, and she was trying to break free of that, and then she, I went to court and I won. I proved there's a significant change of circumstance, which is a, a line that your clients will hear in court. You have to prove a significant change of circumstance, and this time I was able to do that because Amy supported the move. She talked to the judge in chambers, and she was 12 years old, and she was listened to. She related a hor horror story after horror story to me about the things her mother would say about me to both of them. Um, and when my daughter, who was at the time cutting herself and um, threatening suicide, her mother said to me, said to her, well, do it at your father's house. At least you can be seen as the bad guy. Wow. Yeah, it was it's really brutal. And people don't believe this stuff happens. They think it must be me, you know. But at the time we were trying to get her in school, keep her in school, keep her healthy. You know, and for a while it was good. But I'll tell you later if you want what happened to her. Is she okay? Just 
Um, eventually, she overdosed on fentanyl twice oh, wow. and had to, had to have an intervention. And she was put in rehab for the better part of a year. Um, she relapsed a few times, but she's clean now. But emotionally, she's challenged, you know. Um, Ron, how old is she? 22. Okay. Yeah. Dang. Um, yeah. When I talk about long-term trauma and damage, she's a textbook example of it. It's. A, I'm so sorry, Ron. I'm. I'm so sorry. This cannot even be easy to talk about. Well, you know something, Judith. I. I choose not to live in hope. You know, I live by the facts. My situation is such that I can't really do much to change it. I can work on behalf of other children. But unless something miraculous happened to turn my children around, I have no impact there at all. And I choose to survive. I've got a loving partner um, in, in my, we're not married, but my wife um, and her family and um, my eldest daughter who lives in London, who also suffered at the hands of my ex-wife. But now we've got a wonderful relationship. We speak every day on WhatsApp and I see my grandchildren every day. And that consoles me. That's wonderful. No, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you have that at least. You, you, there's a little bit of a running theme. So before the divorce, before you file for the divorce, make sure that you have some documentation of a positive relationship with your children. Absolutely. And then during the divorce, frozen you again. said this um, a few times, do not bad mouth the alienating parent. Keep your cool. Is that one of the most important things to remember? Especially in light of the fact that your children might be treating you badly and you still have to maintain your equanimity and try not to badmouth the other parent because they will report that back to the other parent. Without a doubt, just mm -hmm. to be in that parent's favor, I guess, mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're in court. Mm -hmm. What are some of the best tips you can give for how to present yourself a get a great lawyer who understands you know what let's go back to this for a second you're going to need a lawyer you're going to need a whole bunch of people you na you named guardian ad litem minors counsel i mean be prepared to use a significant amount of money but what are the questions to ask how do you know whether you've hired the right attorney or therapist schooled in parental alienation well, first of all, you have to recognize the signs that you are a victim. You and your children are a victim of parental alienation. You have to, if you if you're in any doubt about whether that's happening, read, research, talk to an expert. You know, Dr. Steinberg is an expert. If you're looking for treatment, she's available, and she's the foremost expert on parental alienation in the Los Angeles area, without a doubt. You know, um, she will listen. She will know the difference between it. The alienator always presents in court as the calm and collected one. And the alienated parent will usually present as raging, confused, angry, frustrated, and they will be seen as the um, propensitor of, uh, if that's a word, of violence towards the children. You know, so in order to, to get what you want in court, you have to present as the rational, calm individual whose only uh, desire is the welfare of your children. You're not there to not to make huge broad accusations not rage against the machine not interrupt a judge you know um but just present as calm and rational and make your case okay um i did bullet point those and there's one thing ask for consequences now when you're in court you're developing the co-parenting schedule and the co-parenting relationship and all of this will go into some kind of written documentation mm -hmm. that you must always have at your side if you need it to present to local authorities if something interrupts uh, the co-parenting schedule, correct? Waste of time. <laughs> the and local authorities someone... won't do a damn thing. You call really? the police. I, I stood outside my ex's house when she wouldn't let the children come to visit me during my time. And it took them forever to get there. And when they got there, they said they couldn't, they knocked on the door. She didn't answer the door. We all knew she was in there. She didn't answer the door. They didn't do anything about that. They just said to me, take it to court. What, so, count, what county was this in, by the San way? San Bernardino, but it's not just uh, San Bernardino specific. It happens everywhere. Well, I had the court order in my hand. Okay, so maybe it does happen 
there are those maybe rare times when the police do respond because it it actually happened to a friend of mine. Um, it was an unmarried parental relationship. Uh, he was of dubious reputation and he would not give the child back to my friend and she had the court orders she went right to the police they came with her to his house and took the child out of the house so once in a while it really does work but in sure. your experience not a hundred percent no and not I, even I, close. In the experience of other people i've spoken to the same thing happened but okay I'm, I'm glad for your friend yeah i thought that happened a lot i mean i thought that that was a shoe in that mm -hmm. you took this to the police and they would mm -hmm. come to your rescue because it, it is a breach of contract. Mm -hmm. So if anything with the uh, co-parenting schedule, it doesn't happen on time. It's a breach of contract because that settlement agreement or that court order is a legally binding contract. But here's what you do. You get a, a crime number that you've, that you've reported it to the police and they will write a report saying what happened and you take that with you to court okay. for a change of custody, you okay. know, and or, uh, you might even charge her with contempt because she's breached the court order. It hardly ever happens, but at the very least, you might be able to get a restraining order against her breaking the court order. Of course, inevitably, the alienator will say, well, it's not me. The children don't want to go. This happens over and over again. That's the big sign that alienation is taking place. Children, want, I can't do anything about it. I've tried to get them to go, but they don't want to go. They have a terrible time there. They cry all the time. That's that's big sign right there. And you hit on a good point. And this, for, this is for after the divorce, and I highlighted this. And even if it's not a parental alienation situation, it's just um, parents are still fighting and it's after the divorce, mm -hmm they start saying, well, the children didn't want to go. What am I supposed to do? What are they supposed to do, Ron? If the if the What if the children justifiably don't want to go? I mean, they the actually signs, don't. One of the signs of parental alienation is parentifying the children, over-empowering the children. Mm. The children do not have the right to make a decision about where they go. If the court has ordered them to be with the other parent, they, they will... In some occasions, I, I grant you, they, the, the parent that they're supposed to go to might be behaving badly. That's down to the other parent. The children and that parent have to learn to live with each other. You know, the court has ordered them to be with that parent and they should go. You know, not all parents behave well all the time. And if the alienating parent or the parent saying the other parent is behaving badly really feels they're in danger, then they go to court and prove it. Right. But in the meantime, the children should go to the parent that they've been ordered to go to at those times. Right, because I worry a lot of times um, if there's anger management issues with mm -hmm. one parent or uh, the parent isn't focused on the children when they the children drink. are with him or her, mm -hmm. uh, they're doing other things. And this is when the kids can easily hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. So unintentionally, they're they're hurting their children. So, yes, if. If, if if a parent feels that there's truly an issue with the other parent that would endanger the children, then you don't go through bad mouthing and manipulating on your own. You take it to court. That being said, when do you become completely exhausted and give up? Oh, people do, you know, um, it's, it's very easily done, not very easily done, but it happens. Um, there's a, a wonderful movie that was produced in Brazil called A Death Invented, all about parental alienation. And in that film, they interview at children who were uh, adults who were alienated as children and separate frames, they interview the parents. And in that, in that um, movie, one parent says, you know, I saw the look in their eyes when I was with them and and I, they, I knew they didn't want to be with me, so I just let them go. I figured I'd see them in a few years and everything would be fine. And then it switched to the children, who are adults now, and they say, did they say to you that he saw uh, that we didn't want to be with him? But we did want to be with him. I know we behaved badly, but we did want to be with him. He should have stuck with us and been patient with us. Aww. You know, my parent, my kids behaved atrociously for years, and I'd never ever gave up on them and i'm still haven't given up on them 
And we shouldn't give up on our children. They are, after all, only children. They look to us for guidance, and it's not only the guidance that come out of our mouths, but the way we behave in front of them and towards them and towards other people. And if you live a life of integrity and honor and love, hopefully the children will see that. You know, Judith, after a year or so of this behavior, all of a sudden one day at my home, the children started treating me nicely. And it was a shock. You know, Carol was there, my partner was there, and we just looked at each other. They said nice things. And I, I, was, I felt like it all entered an alternate universe, you know, because they'd been so miserable towards me for so long. And they were starting to be nice. And then they got nicer and nicer. We started going away on trips together, went to Yosemite together. We had a blast, you know, um, and then it all turned pear-shaped again. And, well, and Okay, wait a minute. What was the turning point in what ages were they? Oh, God, you know, it just happened such a long time ago. I don't, my memory of those specific- Were they high school yet? No, they weren't high school yet. They okay. were middle school. Okay. Middle school they were, by that time. All right, very good. And then, you know, they, then they reverted back? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. While, while they were still minors, while they were, mm -hmm. before they graduated from mm -hmm. high school? Yeah. Because, do you, okay, are you speculating that mom became upset that they may have said nice things about you when they went home? Probably, you know, nothing bad happened in our house. We went to Florida together to visit my father, who's passed now. We went to Yosemite together. We went on all kinds of trips together. We had a blast, you know, and nothing terrible happened when they were with me. Uh, I knew by that time how I had to behave and how I was with them. And I felt if I could just, I knew there were rituals which they would enjoy. For instance, when I would pick them up from school and brought them back to my house, they misbehaved. But if I picked them up and took them to Chipotle and we had lunch together at Chipotle after school, they would be you know, animated at the table and they would talk. And then they liked my guacamole. So I would take them to Trader Joe's. They'd like to trade, go to Trader Joe's. They would say, buy this, buy this. And we would have a great time at the house. We would sit down, eat potato chips and guacamole and watch American Idol. That was the other thing that they loved. We would sit down together. But as soon as those things were finished, they would get up, walk into their room, close the shades, put their hoods on and sit there for hours without communicating. It was bizarre. And when, when it came time for their mother to pick them up, they would march through my house to the window to look out the front of the house to wait for their mother. When she came, not a word, they would throw open the door and run down the lawn without saying goodbye. And I was alone in the house. Okay, this is, uh, you're the first person I've really listened to explain what it was like in real life. Mm -hmm. um, how is it now with those two and you? Well, my, my daughter hasn't spoken to me in about a month. Um, my son, I told you, he's, I have, I have no idea where he is. But honestly, he graduated last year from a college in New York with a degree in acting. Uh, and I don't know whether we've mentioned this or not, but I was a professional actor in the UK for 25 years. So I am in him, you know. Um, so I take some pride in that. I don't know whether he's here or there. I have no idea where he is. I have no contact with him, but I'm proud of him. If he's being an actor, it's what he wanted to do. And I wasn't around enough to influence him. Yeah, genetics are are, are fascinating. You said your daughter hasn't spoken to you in a month. Is yeah, this we had an argument. off again, on again relationship? I know she loves me. She said so many times, even when we've been arguing. But, you know, she's 22. She wants to go her own way. Um Last year, Carol and I went up to visit her where she's living. Uh, she's out of state. I bought her a car for her 21st birthday. And that pretty much saved her life. She got out of an re abusive relationship. She went on her own. I gave her the car. And she's making a life for herself where she is. And she, she still has problems with me and misunderstands my intentions and, and blames me for all kinds of stuff. I'm I, like, like a virus is still inside her yeah. that she can't control, you know, and... Um, Nothing I can do about it. It's like her mother has invaded her again, you know, and it's just tough. Kids relapse, you know, they, they're they so alienated that they they make amends with their alienated parent, but they relapse and they start treating that parent badly, even though nothing's happening because it's in them. Yeah. The alienation's in them like a virus. Understood. Uh, two things quickly in my head and, and we're getting close to the end. Uh, a, how do children... Uh, 
of parental alienation have relationships on their own? Probably not well, I would think. I got as far as how do children of parental alienation and have relationships of their own? Uh, I know um, that my son has had a couple of relationships and they've ended. I don't know if they were ended badly, but they were they were enduring. Um, my daughter is in a relationship with somebody right now who's clean, you know, and drug free and and an honorable man. So that's working. Uh, it's not always the case. You know, children of alienation have long term problems with relationships, with school, with diet, um, have suffered from suicidal ideations, you know, and it's just. Right monstrous monstrous if parents you just really understood but you just mentioned one of your girls one of your kids would just got out of an abusive relationship i just heard you say that mm -hmm. my younger daughter i was in an abusive relationship and she got out she extricated herself to her credit you know but then she was alone in this town where she lives now and so we helped her as much as we could we we continued to help her financially um but she is at a point now where she doesn't want to have contact with her, with me. And I've got to respect that. All right. I know the love there is strong. And then was there ever a point when you wanted to have your ex-wife diagnosed uh, because she may not be the healthiest person to raise children? Did that ever cross your mind? She would never get diagnosed. She is utterly convinced in the rightness of her ways. I've had no contact with her. even No, for, no forced, forced diagnosis, di diagnosis through the court. Well, I don't see how that would happen. My children are adults now. I have no control over that situation. No, no, no. I'm, I'm asking. It was a past Sorry. tense question. Did you ever think of that at any time? No, I couldn't have forced the issue. I wouldn't have known I had that available to me. You okay. Know. And I don't really know that either, except there are lots of times when diagnoses are requested through court order. And um, and I just wondered if that if that was one of them. No, you, what do, no, you, what um, do you do with the person who is a high conflict personality? What well, do don't you try do to change them. them. Don't try mm -hmm. to change them. You know, Bill Eddy, you know, he he produced he was in a film that I produced for a fundraising website that, that I have. We're trying to raise funds to. Uh, and act this legislation. And he appeared in this film that I produced together with um, several other scientists who are who know about this much more than I do. Um, but Bill would say, don't try to change them. Be patient and listen, but control the room. If you're a mediator, that's what you've got to do. Because they are bully and they would say, I know my, my ex introduced herself in court as a children's ambassador. The self-aggrandizement involved in this kind of narcissism is limitless. You know, you can't change them. It's she's really, I think, unbalanced. She saw the children as extensions of herself. And when one of them escaped, she did everything she could to bring them back. And I'm not saying she's alone in this, but she was particularly good on that. She saw a chance when my daughter was in rehab. And since she had joint legal custody, she went in, swooped and was the parent who said yes when I was saying no. Luckily, I went to court and stopped her from doing what she was going to do. And my daughter left relatively intact. Oh, yeah, well, it's a tough one. Is, I mean, this is such a huge discussion to have, and I'm extremely sorry that this happened to you, um, but as many people as you can help, thank you for, for trying to do this. It's the children that we're trying to help, you know, yeah, the adults should have to help themselves, arm themselves with information, you know, take proactive, be proactive. Uh, information about... Uh, your work, your legislative work will be on your website. And I'll put that link and the link is in the show notes for people who like to just jot a contact number or contact information down as they're listening. What would be best way to contact you? My work number is 909-283-3991. Again? 909 909- Two eight three three nine nine one, and I can also be reached online at Magnum Mediation. You probably see that over my shoulder over there, MagnumMediation.com. You know, uh, the thing is, Judith, when I mediate a high conflict divorce, something like that, with my experience as a mediator, I have to be unbiased and I focus on the welfare of the child. 
I don't blame either parent, no matter what they present to me. And I focus on doing what's right for the child because I think that's what all divorce uh, professionals try to do. I think so too. It's not my job to take sides. Right, exactly. Um, Yes, but but at least you can come to the table, so to speak, with... um, with information and um, experience and, and and process going forward. So thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. Very welcome. And thank all of you for listening. I appreciate it. If you have any comments on this, please post them. I'll put them in a blog. If you would like to participate in an ongoing conversation about this, I think it would be phenomenal. Uh, Topics about children uh, definitely pull big numbers on this podcast, and I kind of think on most. And if you would like to present any other topics with me, you can do it through my website, theamicabledivorceexpert.com. And as always, have an amicable day.